Welcome to the Coupler IO Academy, where industry experts share tips and tricks on working with data. In this video, we will explain how to use the Google Finance formula in Google Sheets. Hi, my name's Josh. If you invest in stocks, trade currencies, monitor commodities, or simply bought a Bitcoin back when it was cheap, then you'll love the Google Finance formula. It can fetch tons of real-time and historical data from all sorts of markets and can empower powerful financial reports and automations. In this video, I'll help you learn how to use Google Finance in your projects. Not only that, I'll give you a bunch of practical examples of how you can use this formula to your advantage. Ready? Let's do it. Google Finance function in Sheets has the following syntax. Ticker is the only mandatory argument, and it can be a ticker for a stock, a currency, an index, a cryptocurrency, and more. Attribute states what data you want to get for a chosen ticker. By default, it's the latest price, but there's a lot of customization you can do here. I'll talk more about this later. The next two arguments are used to grab the historical data for a chosen ticker. You can choose specific start and end dates or customize these parameters a bit. Finally, interval is the frequency of returned data. You can choose from a daily or weekly interval. All right, let's give it a try. I've set up an empty spreadsheet and will type in the Google Finance function. I want to see the stock price of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Their ticker is Google. And here's the result. Note that the result may be up to 20 minutes late, of which you're informed by the bar at the bottom of the screen. You'll see throughout this video that the rates sometimes change on your screen. The changes are, however, infrequent and most of the time delayed. For that reason, I wouldn't recommend live trading solely based on the data fetched with Google Finance. For any other purpose, however, this data should be just fine. Let's try to get some currency exchange rate. For example, I'll look up how much US dollars I could get for one euro. When fetching data for currencies, it's worth using the currency prefix to avoid accidentally fetching data for stocks or funds with similar tickers. And one more example. Let's check what the Bitcoin is currently worth. Here you type in the cryptocurrency ticker and then you must also specify the regular currency to display the price in. Here, US dollars. Tickers across different markets are not unique. For example, the stock exchanges in New York, Sydney and Amsterdam can feature a company with the same ticker. So how will Google Finance know which one you have in mind? You can avoid misunderstandings by typing in a prefix of a market that the securities are traded on. If you don't provide such information, Google will aim to guess which item you had in mind and sometimes it may not work out in your favor. Let's say I'm interested in buying the Apple stock that trades on NASDAQ. I remember its ticker starts with double A followed by P, so I type in AAP into the Google Finance formula. I remember that the stock traded at well over $100 not long ago, so seeing the results makes me wonder what happened. Has there been a crash in the market? Have they recalled all iPhones five years into the past? Either way, I'm buying all the stock I can get right away, because this price won't last long. Luckily, something stops me, and to my disappointment, I find that AAP, in fact, has nothing to do with Apple, nor even mobile phones. It's a ticker for Advanced Auto Parts Inc, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Ah, tough luck. <laughs> Had I typed in NASDAQ before the ticker, the function would have quickly told me that there's no such stock on NASDAQ. This may have prevented me from investing all my life savings in the AAP stock. After another search, I fix the ticker for Apple and I get the correct rate this time. Same as with any other function, I can reference a cell with a ticker rather than type it in. I've added a few stocks from NASDAQ to my spreadsheet. Now I can type in the function, reference a stock in column A, and stretch the formula onto the next two rows. Now let's talk about the attributes of Google Finance function. If you don't type in the second argument or specify price, you'll get the last known price for the chosen ticker. It's the default attribute. There are plenty of other attributes you can take advantage of, and the available options will depend on whether you're fetching real-time or historical data. 
In column C, I'll add the formula again, and this time use the change attribute, which tells me how much the price has changed as compared to the closing price on the previous trading day. Apple, for example, is 80 cents more expensive, while Meta has climbed over $3. While we're at it, I can add some conditional formatting to quickly highlight which stocks go up and which go down. If the change is greater than zero, I want the cell highlighted green. And for the negative change, I want to have the red highlight. If there's no change, then the cell will remain transparent. For the same set of stocks, I'll also use the high and low attributes, which are basically the highest and lowest prices of stocks on the current trading day. And let's also fetch the trading volume for each of these stocks. I'll format it for better readability. And I think we're ready to go. I've shown you five different attributes, but in fact, there are many more you can use with real-time data. For example, you can fetch the 52-week high and low price, the earnings per share for a stock, an average trading volume, and more. I won't show you all the available attributes, but we've got them listed and described for you in the article on our blog, and you can check the link in the corner of your screen. And now, let's extract some historical data with the Google Finance function. I'm interested in the stock for Visa, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. For now, price is what interests me the most. The next argument is the start date. I need to wrap it in quotes and use the month day, year format, each separated with a forward slash. Let's pick the 1st of January 2023 and set the 31st as the end date. Instead of the precise date, you could also insert a number indicating how many days after the start date you want to fetch the data for. As the last argument, I can specify daily, which I'll get data for each day in the chosen date range. The outcome is a table with the closing price of a stock for every trading day. Let's customize the formula a bit. The choice of attributes is more limited for historical data than it was for real-time extracts. You can fetch the open and close price, the high and low, as well as volume. The sixth and final attribute, all, lets you fetch all of the five mentioned attributes at once. Running this will print a nice summary for Visa stock in January. Rather than inserting the date in quotes, you can use the date function and specify as parameters year, month, and day in this order. I'll repeat it for the end date, and you can see that it returned exactly the same table as before. As for the last argument, you can skip it if you want to use the daily interval. Instead of daily, you can insert one instead, which will give exactly the same outcome. If you prefer a weekly interval, type in 7 instead, or write weekly wrapped in quotes. Collecting lots of historical data with the Google Finance will clutter your spreadsheets and may not give you the insights you need right off the bat. I promised some practical examples, so how about we compare Visa to its popular competitor and visualize how both stocks performed over the last couple of years? I'll focus on the price attribute. Let's also extend the date range way into the past, until the beginning of 2019. Rather than specify the end date, you can use a function like today to collect the data up until the current date. Now, to the right, I'll copy in the formula and fetch the data for the MasterCard stock. And now, let's insert a chart and move it further to the right. For starters, I'll adjust the data range to capture all data. Since more rows will be added every week, it's best to extend the range right away. The series labels aren't particularly descriptive, but I can expect that the first close is for the Visa stock, and the second one must be for MasterCard. Let's make it clear through the legend and add a more descriptive title. Of course, I could customize the chart further by fixing the labels or adding moving averages with respective Google Sheets functions but I'll let you play with this on your own while I jump to the next example. The Google Finance function in Google Sheets is also excellent for monitoring the currency exchange rates and using it for your calculations. I have savings in different currencies, and I listed them all in column A. In column B, I store the current amount in each currency, fetched perhaps from my bank or other financial application. 
I want to convert all these savings into my home currency and sum it up. I could just type in the Google Finance formula as usual. Here, I would specify that it's a currency that we're dealing with. Next, let's say I want to convert everything to euros. So I type in the USD EUR pair. And now I'll multiply the amount field to get the amount in euros. This worked fine, but it's not very scalable. If I want to change the output currency, I'll need to edit every formula. What's more, I would now need to write this formula over and over again for each of the following six currencies. What I can do instead is concatenate the data and make references to cells with currency symbols. I'll type in the home currency here. Let's say it will be the South African Rand, which goes by the ticker ZAR. Going back to the formula, I'll keep the currency word with a colon. I'll add the ampersand symbol to concatenate. The first will go from the currency I convert from, and then the home currency. And this gives me the amount in Rand right away. To stretch the formula onto other currencies, I need to first add dollar symbols around the E2 cell, and then expand. All currencies are quickly converted to the desired currency, and I can sum them up right away. At any time, I can change the home currency, for example, to a Brazilian real, and the data will update automatically. You can fetch many other things with Google Finance. It could be different indexes. You can collect data from some international markets, although the available options here varies. Your best bet is trying out a ticker and checking if it works with the formula. There are also various cryptocurrencies where you typically type in the ticker of a given crypto and then the output currency, like USD here. Commodities like gold or oil are not available through the Google Finance formula, but there's plenty of stocks or funds that track the prices of a given commodity. You can follow them just as I did here. Keep in mind that Google Finance displays prices in the currency that securities are traded in. For stocks, you can use the currency attribute to learn which currency the price is displayed in. Silver Bs are, for example, traded on a stock exchange in India, so you'll need to convert the currency if you care about having everything in, say, US dollars. The method I showed on the previous screen will work just fine. If you want to add more stocks or related securities, but don't know their ticker, you may just want to type them into Google. Here, for example, I searched for the Uber stock. I fetched its ticker and pasted it into my spreadsheet. Now I can just extend the formula to get the stock price. Oh wait, I've got an error. Why? Google and other pages tend to add spaces before the stock name for better readability of tickers. When copy-pasting tickers, make sure you remove the spaces and your formula will work just fine. And now let's get some historical data for each security visualized. I'll type in the Google Finance formula one more time and choose to fetch the closing price. As a start and end date, I can use the today function, here indicating that I want to fetch data from 30 days ago up until today. I'll skip the last argument because the daily schedule works perfectly fine. This returned a table like many others we've seen before. Don't worry though, I won't leave it like that. Instead, I'll use this data as a source for my spark line. And now let's expand onto the other rows. Of course, I could customize the spark lines in a lot of ways, display them as column charts, color appropriately, and so on. And if you're curious about how to do this, then be sure to check out our spark line function tutorial. Before I wrap up, I wanted to share one final useful trick. As I mentioned earlier, Google Sheets serves the data with up to 20 minutes delay. The data will sometimes refresh as you work with a spreadsheet, but one way to get the fresher data is to refresh the spreadsheet. This may not make your data up to date with the markets down to a second, but nevertheless, it will likely load the more recent data than what you had before. Another thing you can do is go to the spreadsheet settings. In the calculation tab, set the recalculation to happen on change and every minute. This will give you a more frequent data refresh without the need to reload the file over and over again.
And that's it. Now you know how to use the Google Sheets finance function, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like, share the video with others, and subscribe to our channel so you never miss a thing. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.